I appreciate that. Very beautiful. Uh, you know, just to let you all know that all of these events that we just announced, they're available online at houseofthegospel.org. And uh, actually all the registration, or most of the registrations for these announcements are available online as well. So uh, houseofthegospel.org, check out the website and keep those events in mind. Can you guys hear me? Good morning, by the way. Welcome to House of the Gospel. I'm happy that you are here with us today celebrating, what are we celebrating today? End of January. January. It's a Sunday, the last Sunday of January. This is a time period when 50% of all the resolutions are done. Nobody wants to do their resolution anymore. Nobody wants to quit the sweets anymore. Nobody wants to go to the gym anymore. Those of you who are consistently in the gym tomorrow, text me if you see less people than you saw yesterday. Okay? I, I guarantee you, People are done with their resolutions, at least 50% of the people. The, the other 30% will be done at the end of February, and by the end of the year, it'll be 10% with their resolutions. Uh, you know, uh, very, very interesting that people love to be unique. People love to be distinct. People love to be different compared to others. Overall, for the most part, uh, we, as individuals, are created very similar. Uh, the way our body functions, uh, the way our body is put together, uh, for the most part, there's more similarities between us, among us, than there are differences. And even when it comes to like, even those like, racial differences or ethnic differences, it's really just a very tiny part of our DNA that is the difference. Uh, the biggest percentage of our DNA is actually how we are similar. But at the same time, we want to be different. We want to stand out. We want to be unique. We want to uh, be noticed. And so what do we do sometimes? Uh, sometimes we uh, color our hair in weird colors. Pink is the weirdest one. Uh, I don't know why you would do that. Sometimes we have the... Uh, the most beautiful nails that are this long and that are sharper than a sharpest uh, knife, right? Sometimes we try to put on the best shirt, we try to make the best haircut, we try to look the buffest that we can, right? Because we want to, in some sense, you probably are saying, that's not true, that's not why I'm doing this, I don't want to stand out. But somewhere back in, your, back in, in, in the back of your mind, you're like, yeah, this is, I want people to notice me right? We want to be distinct. We want to uh, be unique. We want to be noticed. And that's what we do. We find ways to look different than others. Uh, This may be through appearance. This may be even through talents. Uh, Like what, what what can this person play and what can this person play? It makes us unique or it distinguishes us from others. Uh, Even when you go to the store, you go to Costco, you go to Whole Foods, or you go to Foodmax, wherever you go, wherever you shop, there's no discrimination between the stores. Do your thing. But when you go, you know, you're choosing the products you want to buy. Even then, you see that they are labeled differently. Even though it's still the same plain yogurt, one is plain but non jmo the other is plain but jmo. I don't know, something like that, right? Ones are again. And so you come and you're like, okay, here's my choices. And first thing you look at, you don't taste these things, right? But the first thing you look at is the label. So in each company, each product, each uh, business tries to distinguish or tries to make it so that one package is better looking or better labeled than the other so that you can go for that one. Uh, loyalties to sports make us unique. Those of you who are 49ers fans, you'll be crying tonight, and that's okay. I understand. And you will be distinguished that way. So anyone who's crying tonight, you're probably a 49ers fan. I'm already making that distinction. Um, Last week was, yeah, the tears were frozen. Uh, But yeah, uh, you know, we, we, we put stickers on our cars Some of you who have children in elementary school or even middle school or maybe even high school, you know, your kid brings that certificate that they're on a roll or honor roll 
or on a roll, I don't know, whatever. But they bring that certificate, right? They're on a roll somewhere. They're going somewhere. Or you already have a sticker on the back of your car that says, my student is an honor roll student at blah, blah, blah school, right? Uh, and it distinguishes your child from other children, right? At work, we get distinguished in a way, uh, in different ways. Why am I talking about these distinguishes and distinctivenesses? Because today's topic is actually titled The Mark of Distinctiveness. And uh, actually, uh, when God looks at us and when God looks at the people, he actually has, some, he, he has a way to distinguish us as well. And he wants us to be distinct in his presence. So today we're continuing our topic of studying Joshua, and I will really want to encourage you to take out your booklets, to take notes. If you don't have the booklet, there are plenty downstairs at the info desk. You should have grabbed one. If you didn't, shame on you. Uh, I will distinguish you now from everyone else. Um, but we are on part four. Part four of this booklet where you can take some notes uh, and follow along as, as, as we're studying this topic. God always desired that his people be set apart from others. God always wanted for his people to be di distinct from others. And most importantly, that distinctiveness is in the holiness that he gives to his people. So the main topic here, we're going to think about how God calls us or calls his people to holiness. When, uh, as we're studying Joshua, we know that uh, we're coming up to, we came up to a place, if you were with us last Sunday, you heard the sermon on YouTube, we started by seeing the Israelites before a Jordan River ready to cross the Jordan River to the Promised Land, and last Sunday, the Israelites crossed the Jordan. Remember that? Last Sunday, we were celebrating, we were excited that two new pastors were ordained, and we were telling them how not to cross and how to cross the Jordan River. So the Israelites now cross the Jordan River, and we're going to be in chapter 5, and we're going to be reading that now God says, now that you've crossed the Jordan River, you're not done yet. <laughs> There's one more thing I want you to do. So go ahead and open your Bibles, and I want to remind you, the very first sermon we had on this topic, Pastor Eugene challenged you and said, bring your hard copy of the Bible. Yesterday at the men's breakfast, we decided that when you bring your hard copy, it's open carry, and when you uh, pull up your Bible on your phone, it's uh, not open carry. Concealed, that's the word I was looking for, concealed carry. So let's open carry our Bibles, okay? Let's do that. Ladies, that's all I'm going to say of what happened yesterday. Uh, those men who missed the breakfast yesterday, you missed out. Chapter 5, Joshua, first nine verses. Now, if for some reason you don't have a Bible, tell us. We'll provide one for you. And, uh, or you can look at the screen and follow along as we read. Joshua, chapter 5, first nine verses. The Israelites crossed the Jordan, and as soon as they did, as soon as all the kings uh, so as soon as they crossed the Jordan, all the kings of Amorites who were beyond the Jordan to the west and all the kings of Canaanites who were by the sea, they heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan for the people of Israel until they had crossed over. Their hearts melted and there was no longer any spirit in them because of the people of Israel. So I just want to pause here for just a second. So the enemy hears that the Israelites crossed the Jordan River without an issue. Because the waters parted for them. And they're like, oh my goodness. If their God can part their waters like that, this is crazy. We're afraid. We're not going to be able to fight off these guys. And if you remember, if you were following, up, following with us the study, uh, the, uh, be, even before that, the group of spies, two spies came to Rahab and Rahab told them that we're already afraid of you. And now this adds to more fear that the enemy has. When God does something in your life, when you're following God's calling forward in faith, God is going to send fear into others. He's going to take your fear away from you 
And He's going to give fear to others because you are coming. He's going to give fear to the enemy because you are coming. And now it's not you who is going to be afraid of the enemy, but it's the enemy who is going to be afraid of you because God parts your, the waters in front of you. So that was just a side note here. Let's keep reading the rest of the, this passage. Verse 2, At that time the Lord said to Joshua, Joshua, good job. You've trusted me. You've crossed the river. Here's one more thing you need to do. Make flint knives and circumcise the sons of Israel a second time. So Joshua said, no, I'm not going to do that. It's too painful. No, he didn't. Here's what Joshua says. So Joshua made, he followed the directions. He made flint knives and circumcised all men of Israel at Gibeath Herolot. And this is the reason why Joshua circumcised them. All the males of the people who came out of Egypt, all the men of war, had died in the wilderness on the way after they had come out of Egypt. Though all the people who came out had been circumcised, yet all the people who were born on the way to the wilderness after they had come out of Egypt had not been circumcised. For the people of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness until all the nation... Until, until all the nation, the men of war who came out of Egypt, perished because they did not obey the voice of the Lord. The Lord swore to them that he would not let them see the land that the Lord had sworn to their fathers to give to us a land flowing with milk and honey. So it was their children whom he raised up in their place that Joshua circumcised, for they were uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way. When the circumcising of the whole nation was finished, they remained in their places in the camp until they were healed. And the Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. And so the name of that place is called Gilgal to this day. If you're a good reader, you know that the topic today is going to be about circumcision. That one word, circumcised, uncircumcised, circumcised, uncircumcised. Circumcision. We're not going to talk in details about that word and what it means and all that thing, but let's go back to history and let's see where this whole idea of circumcision came. Why did Israelites need to circumcise? Why did they need to follow through this, all men of Israel? And thank you, worship team. Actually, you sang about that already today. Abraham and the covenant, right? The last song, very nice. So in Genesis chapter 17, verses 10 and 11, Abraham, the uh, great, great, great grandfather of Israelites, has a conversation with God. And they're making a deal. They're making a covenant. They're signing an agreement. And God says, Abraham, I'm going to bless you. I'm, I'm going to bless you so bad that you're going to have so many children that you won't be able to count them. The amount of children you're going to have is going to be the amount of stars you see in the heaven. The amount of sand grains that you see on the sand. You won't be able to count them. This is how much I'm going to bless you. And from your people, there will be a Savior who comes and saves humanity. And Abraham's like, yes. <laughs> Sounds like a great deal, God. And God says, okay, good, because you believe, I will call you righteous. But here's one little part of the covenant that I want you to do. And we read in verse 10, this is my covenant, God tells Abraham, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. So this was an agreement that God struck with Abraham, and this is how they solidified this covenant. This is how they sealed this covenant, with a circumcision. Circumcision was an outward sign of inward obedience. Circumcision did not save Abraham, Circumcision did not make Abraham righteous and his, all of his followers. It didn't make them righteous. What made him righteous is his obedience to God and his faith in God. And circumcision was an outward symbol of that. 
I almost want to say that it's almost like the baptism that we do. You believe, you repent, you say, Jesus, forgive me for my sins, and as a seal, as a symbol of that relationship, of that covenant, you get baptized with water baptism. And the reason it's public is because you are proclaiming to everyone, I believe in Jesus Christ. So if you haven't been baptized yet, we are planning a baptism in March, and we're inviting you to be baptized. I'll see you February 12th here at church, and we'll go through this class 101, and we'll baptize you in March. There you go. So that's a symbol of agreement between us and Jesus. You know, God wants His people to be set apart. That is His wish. That is, his, that is what He wants. He wanted Hebrews to be distinguished from others before crossing to the promised land, and he wants us the same thing for us. It was God's way of marking his people to show that people belong to him. You know, throughout the scripture, circumcision is not only used as a physical circumcision, but throughout the scriptures, throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, the idea of circumcision is used as a metaphor, a metaphor for holiness. Let me give you a few examples. Moses, you guys know all the, the you, you should all know this guy, let my people go, right? Moses is asked by God to take the Israelites out of Egypt. And Moses says, no, I can't because I cannot speak. And actually the phrase that he uses, he says, I have uncircumcised lips. And I'm not talking about Botox right now. What are the uncircumcised lips? Well, basically, he meant, he said, I'm not ready. I'm not ready to be part of your plan, Lord. I'm not clean enough. My lips are not clean enough. I cannot speak very well. So that was his way to say, I cannot and I'm not fit to participate in God's program. Jeremiah, another prof prophet in the Old Testament, speaks of uncircumcised ears. <laughs> okay, don't be checking your ears right now, all right? Uncircumcised ears is a metaphor for ears that are unfit to hear God's word. Those who refuse to hear God's word. And the last one, I actually want to project it on the screen. Jeremiah 4.4 4 talks about uncircumcised hearts. Where God tells the people of Israel through Jeremiah, circumcise yourselves to the Lord Remove the foreskin of your hearts. And when we look at this and we go uh, fast forward to when Jesus comes and we say, you know what? Good thing we don't have to do physical circumcisions today. And praise God that he sent Jesus Christ who circumcises our hearts. A circumcised heart is a spiritual part of a person where decisions are made. It is a radical spiritual surgery on a heart where Jesus comes in and he begins to cut off anything that uh, is an obstacle to our relationship with him. Cut off this habit, that habit, this sin, this temptation, and we come to Christ and we say, Jesus, forgive me and circumcise my heart so that I can be clean before you. Purify my heart. When we're talking about circumcision of heart, we're talking about belonging to God and being holy in His presence. And I want to make one real quick distinguish, distinguishment here. This phrase, God wants His people to be set apart, can be misinterpreted. And a lot of groups... Religious groups actually do misinterpret it. When God wants His people to be set apart, He doesn't want His people to be set apart from someone. He wants them to be set apart for someone. It's not being set apart from someone, it's being set apart for someone. Here's what I mean. God sets us apart for Him. He doesn't set us apart so that we don't ever talk to anyone outside the church. 
It's not about, you know, I'm going to live here in my little house of the gospel community. I don't know anyone. I don't want to hear anyone. I don't want to see anyone. I don't want to speak to anyone. I don't want to communicate with anyone because God set me apart. That's not the community that God is looking for, and that's not what God intended for Israel to be. He said, I want you to be circumcised as an act of obedience to me because you belong to me. And God actually did use Israel to spread his glory to other nations. And so when we talk about being set apart, we're talking about being set apart for use by him. So that when he circumcises us, our hearts and our actions change, others seeing the change in our lives will believe in him and be set apart for him as well. So, last thing, in order to move forward in faith, you must be made holy through circumcision. You must be sanctified through circumcision. God calls His people to holiness. A holy person is not an odd person. It's not necessarily being a weird person. A holy person is not a perfect person. A holy person is someone who puts his faith or her faith in Jesus Christ and is forgiven by Jesus Christ. We'll read 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. This is in the New Testament. But as he... That is God who called you, that is follower of Jesus. So as he who is called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy because you do all these things. You shall be holy because you go to church. You shall be holy because you pray. You shall be holy because you are uh, volunteering your time. You shall be holy because you give money to the church, right? Right? What does this passage say? You shall be holy. Why? Because God is holy. Because Jesus is holy. And our actions are a result of the fact that we are sanctified by Him. You know, the sanctification, when I use that big weird word, it means being made more and more holy by God. And you know, that process is not easy. And it's not painless. It's actually a very painful process to be sanctified and to be more, made more and more holy by God. You think being circumcised was a painless process? I don't think so. With flint knives? I don't know. I've never used a flint knife, but I don't know how sharp you can get. It was a very painful process. And there's no morphine, by the way. You can't get high and do it. Man, maybe there was some grass. I don't know. I didn't research that too deep. But it was a painful process, not because of how it happened, but also because the pain oftentimes would last for up to a week in adult men. And the recovery could take up to six weeks. So, being made holy, being circumcised, being made sanctified is a painful process. When God sanctifies us, it's not an easy process. It's not a painless process. It will be painful. You know why? Because those habits that you still hold on to, they need to be cut off from you. Those temptations or those sins that you continue to do need to be cut off. But you're so comfortable already in that. It's so easy to just do what you were doing for for all of your life. I don't want to change my character. I'm comfortable here. I don't want to change my personality. I don't want to change my habits. I'm good here. But God wants his people to be sanctified and to be made holy. He wants to circumcise you. And even though it will be painful at the moment, there will be victory after that. One of the things that holds us back from being made holy by God is fear. Fear slows down the process of being different with God. Fear is the enemy of faith. 
I think I've mentioned it a few times in the series, and I'm going to mention it again if I ever get a chance to preach on the series again. Fear is the enemy of faith. And you can beat faith, fear <laughs> with faith. Or fear can have victory over faith. One more thing to consider here. Check out this verse 8 in Joshua. When all the men were circumcised of the whole nation, they remained in their places in the camp until they were healed. As I mentioned already, the healing process could have taken up to a month. And these were not just little boys that were circumcised. These were all men, especially men who were of what age? Fighting age. These were soldiers. These were fighters who were circumcised. They, Israelites were risking. They were making a big risk by saying yes to God, circumcise us. It's a huge risk because while you are being recovering, while you're being healed, the enemy can come and overtake you because you're weak. So I only imagine if the Israelite man said no, because what if? What if the enemy will come and attack us? What if the enemy will come and take our children, take our wives, and take our finances? I can't trust you, God, to make this step of faith. I'm afraid of the enemy. But they weren't. And as a result, God protected them from the enemy this whole time as they were recovering. Fear slows down the process of being different with God. Oftentimes as I talk about, talk to people who are so close to just saying, Jesus, forgive me for my sins. I want to be your disciple forever and ever. And the response I get is, but what if? What if I say this? What if I repent and tomorrow I'm going to sin again? The enemy is going to get me tomorrow again. What if? And that fear, it stops us from moving forward in faith in our personal relationship with Christ. Don't let fear overtake your faith. May faith guide your decisions. May faith in God and Jesus Christ guide your decisions. And as we will see, God gives victory to Joshua and the people. And it's an easy victory for them. Because the victory is God's victory. We're going to see that in the future, but it's, it's so interesting. They get circumcised and they don't even have to fight after that. And they get victory without even picking up a sword. Fear is the enemy of faith. And for us to move forward in faith, we should put, we should look at God and not look at fear. And not look at what's going to happen. You know, sometimes when believers, when followers of Jesus think about doing ministry, they're afraid to step into the ministry role. But if I do this, what about my children? What about my spouse? What about my career? What about my finances? And we begin to be afraid to do something for God and make that step of faith because we got all these other things that need to be taken care of. I want to encourage you and I want to tell you that if you are walking with God forward in faith, He will take care of your families. It won't be easy for sure. It's a painful process, but He will take care of your children. He'll take care of your spouse. He'll take care of your finances. He'll take care of your future. I promise you because I've lived through it. In my short years of life, I've already lived through that blessing. And some of you are going through some hard times right now and you're getting circumcised. That's just the process of circumcision. In a few weeks, you'll have victory because God is with you. And if fear is still keeping you from making that decision of stepping forward in faith, may God take away that fear and may you make that decision. And last thing I wanted to say that we see here is that 
God's people must be different in thought and deed. That's the point of circumcision. That's the point of belonging to God. Romans 12, 2, do not conform, be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable perfect and perfect. What does this mean to be different? It doesn't mean that now we've we got to close the doors here and do our own thing and not talk to anyone. That's not what it means. To be different in thought and deed is to think differently. And based on this passage, how do you think differently? How are your thoughts transformed? You, your thoughts are transformed by the renewal of your mind, and your mind is renewed when you are present in God's Word. This is how your mind is renewed. Through prayer, through fellowship with other believers, through reading, the studying this, this word, your mind is renewed. And as a result of your renewal of your mind, your deeds are renewed. Your actions are new. The things you do are different because your mind has been renewed. When we begin to think differently, we begin to live differently. Lord, why can't I get rid of this? Why can't I get rid of this sin that I'm struggling with? Why can't I get rid of this fear? Why can't I get rid of this temptation? And Lord says, renew your mind. Renew your mind. Renew your heart. Just come to Jesus and say, Lord, I want to have faith. I don't want to have fear. I want to have faith. I don't want to have fear. I want to have a relationship, not a religion. I want to follow you. I want to be your disciple. And the way you do it is you just ask Jesus to forgive you your sins and to be your Lord and Savior. Would you stand with me as we spend some time in silence and worship team gets ready to worship? If the Lord has been speaking to you through this sermon, through His Word, uh, through the, the thoughts and the, the, the passages that we were reading, all you got to do is just say, Lord Jesus, forgive me my sins. Jesus Christ, I thank You for dying on the cross for me. Jesus Christ, will you please circumcise my heart? Lord, I want to be your disciple. Take away fear and replace it with faith. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.